Welcome. I do see people joining. I'm going to wait just a few minutes to let everybody mosey on over here. Uh, so if you're just joining now, we're going to get started in just a few moments. I'll be repeating myself a few times here. All right. Okay, for those of you joining now, uh, thank you for coming. We are waiting a few minutes for people uh, trickling in. And uh, so we'll get started in just a minute or two. While you are waiting, if you see the sessions tab over to the right, uh, you will notice that under the sessions tab, there is an option for polls. So there are some polls there, uh, some questions that we are asking to help get to know you better. Uh, if you could go there and answer some of those, that would be wonderful. For those of you that have just joined, we'll be starting in about one more minute. We're just waiting for people to trickle in. Uh, and uh, while you're waiting, if you go over to the sessions tab to the right upper right hand corner of your screen, uh, you'll see under the sessions tab, there are some polls that can be um, uh, that you can do. Hello, Michael. I think we're going to get started in about 30 seconds. Just a few more seconds uh, as people are trickling in here. It looks like we've got a good number of folks uh, attending. All right, let's get started. Thank you for joining one of Data Nerd Day's bonus rounds. Uh, today we'll be talking about service level management, SLOs, SLIs, oh my. Uh, I am Andrew Faria. I'm one of the senior solution architects here at New Relic. And uh, I am one of the co-founders of what we call our Observability Maturity Program, which helps our customers find their way through the um, uh, difficult, uh, difficult uh, paths of building a good observability program. I am also joined here today by Dan Holleran, who is also with New Relic, and he will be helping us with the uh, facilitating this, the chat and uh, any technical issues that we may have. And my esteemed colleague, Elena Pujol, and she is the senior product manager for the up and coming service level management application uh, that you will find out about today and get uh, early access, uh, be able to sign up for early access going forward. So without further ado, let's get started. First things first, we got to take care of some legal mumbo jumbo. So basically what this big giant legal speak slide says is that what you hear today is informational only. Please do not make any investment decisions based on the information that uh, we make today. That's all that really says in plain English. No need to dwell on that. And again, we are here today to talk about establishing real service level objectives and service level indicators with New Relic uh, so that you can make more resilient applications uh, by reducing the cost of incident management and improving your customer experiences. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the New Relic fundamentals, some prerequisites that you may need uh, to do this well. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of service levels. We're going to get into the best practice of service levels, and then we're going to demo the fantastic new up and coming uh, service level management product. And then hopefully, uh, if I do my job well, we'll have a good amount of time to do questions and answers. So again, before you dive into the a uh, complicated world of service level objectives and service level management, there are some prerequisites that you should become familiar with. Um, the first thing is there are some courses on what we call our New Relic University uh, website. You can find that by Googling New Relic University. 
And there you will find what we call our NERCL courses. NERCL is our query language. So for those of you database folks familiar with SQL, uh, it is very similar to SQL. And you really need to have a basic understanding of NERCL before you embark on service level managements. We also have from my team, the service level management implementation guide. These are best practices that we have curated over the years from some of our most successful customers on how to approach service level management. It can be very daunting when you first start reading about it on the Google SRE book or Atlassian's SRE best practices. And it can really be difficult to wrap one's mind around how to make uh, service levels work for uh, yourself as developers and your business as uh, stakeholders involved in uh, your business. And so some, there's some really good fundamental information there that'll help you uh, begin to materialize the best practices of service level management. And then finally, uh, if you don't want to read that document like me, I hate reading, uh, there's a good 45 minute self-paced course in our New Relic University uh, called service level management. So again, Google, you can either Google service level management New Relic or Google New Relic University and grab those courses over there. So let's talk about the history of service levels, SLAs, SLIs, SLOs, et cetera, et cetera. Interestingly, it is not a new concept. You may just be learning about it by uh, reading Google SRE's book and, and Atlassian and others. However, it's been around for uh, quite a long time. I myself got started with service levels several years ago uh, when I was part of what we call a continual service improvement team or CSI. The big joke back then was we were the crime scene investigators of the company I was working for, um, but it's really continual service improvement. And that is a CSI is a function of the information technology uh, library. Uh, so I do uh, encourage you to at least look at some of the history there by Googling uh, ITIL and SRE or ITIL and SLA uh, to see that, you know, where this has come from. Now, of course, uh, the more, uh, the world of software becomes the world of everything, right? Every business is a software business these days. Uh, performance is certainly the number one issue that uh, you and, and the business can run into. And that's what has made observability so popular and so, uh, uh, so interesting in, in today's world. However, when looking for answers, you're certainly going to find the Google and the Atlassian work on SRE. And they do a really good job at introducing you to the world of service level management. Um, I do have some objections to the complexity behind it. Uh, I've spent several years simplifying how it works and you can read that in the implementation guide I mentioned earlier, uh, but definitely been popularized more recently uh, by Google and Atlassian. Um, interestingly, uh, as a side note, the, the more I talk to customers in, uh, today, the more there are more customers today talking about SRE before I even mention it. Whereas just a year ago, uh, you know, this time last year, very few of our customers even mentioned SRE, SLIs, and SLOs. And of course, there's more reading materials on that uh, to be had. So please do, do the research. It's good to know where things come from and why they are the way they are today. So there are some best practices. Like I said, reading the materials uh, is great uh, as a starter. However, uh, really understanding how to, what, what we say, operationalize, which is make these, these things part of our daily exercises, our daily work patterns. Um, there's some best practices in doing that. And one of the, um, one of the most, significant missteps or one of the most significant uh, things folks tend to trip over first is do I apply service levels everywhere? Do I put them on our databases, our Kafka clusters, our middleware? Uh, where do we put them? Where, where do we apply service levels? And the answer is simple. There, uh, within our complex distributed end-to-end -end systems today, even where you have hybrids of monolith and distributed microservices, there are places where requests from your clients are received. Now, when I say client, I mean browser, mobile, or another API application that's hitting your, uh, your products and services. Um, now, those requests 
are received at what we call the service boundary or the output point of your uh, applications. Uh, some people call them external APIs. Some people call them the web portals or the service endpoints or endpoints. Okay, and essentially, uh, after uh, you know, if you do this long enough, you realize that the total sum, the total, the whole of all the performance of all the services within your complex stack really can be measured at that output point to start. So basically, if you are outputting fast and successful non-error responses measured at that output point, um, then you know the total health of your entire system. However, you still need to instrument everything to understand uh, you know, where things are, are going wrong when you see that performance dropping, that output performance dropping. So measure the output. It first, by identifying the service boundaries, right? We call them service boundaries. Now, there are two other places to measure. So once you have your output performance, you now need to make sure that you can connect to that output. And this is usually the load balancer, the CDN, the reverse proxies, um, the ISP layer. And you can do that through our synthetics product. Our synthetics product can be run from points all around the world uh, and test the connectivity of your services. So you have your output performance measured when things are running well and can be connected to. Then you test your connectivity to that particular service so that you know things are connectable or reachable. And then finally, you want to go after the client experience itself. And we save client experience for last because it does require a little extra work to truly get the client experience looking good uh, using our agents. And uh, that is the browser. So we have the browser agent. We think of it as an SDK, right? You load that thing up in your browser and then you add some custom attributes and you can get a good idea of the customer journey. Uh, also the mobile SDK. So you can get to see how the mobile applications are working and if they're crashing, et cetera, et cetera. So the true, the whole story is you have your output performance measured at your service boundaries. You have your connectability or your reachability to those endpoints. And then you have the ultimate a customer experience journey uh, to know if the application on the client side is doing what it's supposed to. Is it rendering correctly and performing and operating and not crashing? OK, um, so as much as that sounds, that's a really simple and effective way to not only in, um, implement service level objectives, but also to increase something that's really important above and beyond all this. And that is the adoption of service levels. So once you put these things on, then it's about getting your boss and your boss's boss and your product managers and your service owners and eventually your executives all to buy in to this is the best way to measure the health of our applications, products and services. So this is really the, the, the simplest way to do that. And then finally, what's the bottom line? So no matter what we do as engineers and developers, there's a bottom line that must be measured and must be uh, adhered to. And the bottom line of all this is, are we improving the number of incidents that are occurring? In other words, are we reducing the number of incidents occurring that's impacting our customers? Are we reducing the amount of time that those incidents are taking? Are we reducing, reducing the duration of those incidents? Um, and those two end up having a dollar value, right? The amount of people involved, how long it's happening and how many times it's happening has a dollar value involved. And we refer to those very simply as mean time to investigate, mean time to repair. And that really has a significant meaning to our bosses and our bosses bosses. OK, so what does service level management look like? Well, there uh, today you can do it two ways. Uh, this is actually uh, an example of service level management on our own NERCL queries, right? So the output uh, of our NERCL queries is measured by the response time and the success rate of our NERCL queries. And what you can see here is numbers that are easy to interpret, easy to understand, and they tell you, are we operating at 100% of expected performance or not? And what does it look like over time, right? And so you can see uh, for the week, we are meeting 99.9% 9 of our expected performance. Uh, for the day, we're meeting 99.59% of expected performance. And then for the hour, it looks like we've dipped a little bit. And you can see those dips over time. So for those of you familiar with Aptex, yes, this is very similar to Aptex. However, 
Uh, the main difference between AppDex and this are two things. One, AppDex has a four times multiplier. So when you use AppDex and you say, I want to, um, I want to know when things aren't responding well uh, or uh, aren't responding within one second, uh, AppDex will multiply that by four in order to consider it bad. In other words, it sets the threshold for you, right? So one times four is four seconds, so it won't really consider things bad until it's four seconds, even though you put one in there. The second thing that's different between AppDex and this is that AppDex only measures response time and error rates collectively, okay, in an aggregate. This does that as well. However, you can do service levels on any metrics. You can do it on Kafka clusters, queue depths, um, database uh, 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 pool connections, right? Number of pool connections available, et cetera, et cetera. So it opens up a whole new world uh, to, uh, to our ability to measure performance and health. So this is an actual customer using service level management. Uh, this customer is a well-known name uh, and they have been, or we're trying to figure out how to do capacity testing uh, more efficiently and more effectively. So essentially uh, having multiple data centers, they would test them by taking a data center down and everyone would look at their own data sets to see what applications were not holding up under the load. And that took several hours, uh, one or two times a quarter. And by using service level management best practices and applying service levels to uh, the boundaries and measuring the output performance of their services, they were able to take a very complex, highly distributed microservices architecture and reduce it down to this very simple display that anyone can understand, developers, engineers, technical, non-technical folks can understand. And they were able to reduce the amount of time it takes to perform these capacity tests to minutes. And it didn't take as many people to do it and they could do it more frequently and they could identify issue uh, that when issues occur, they can identify it much faster. Okay. So that was actually the way we've been doing service level management, uh, what I just showed you, and it's been extraordinarily effective for our customers and they've had enormous success with that. We are now building service level management into the platform so that you can build them faster, organize them more effectively, um, and just be more efficient overall. And so we're going to take a look at uh, some of that. Uh, this is what it looks like now in the new early access program. So uh, again, uh, a little more efficient, a little more streamlined uh, and uh, some more details. So one thing about that previous version is you couldn't really click on things to get a, a view. Now in the early access program, the new service level management uh, uh, product, uh, you can now uh, organize it better, click on it, get more detail uh, and get a little more granularity into what's going on in these service levels. So what we want you to do is, um, uh, really think about joining the early access program, uh, and we're going to put a uh, we're going to put a form in the chat for you to do that to sign up for that. Or uh, if you have an account uh, executive or an account team at New Relic, please reach out to them, and they'll get you set up on that early access program. Um, the other really great thing about uh, the new service level management product is you can do it as code. So a new thing, and it is relatively new, there's not much history to it, but the new thing out there today is there's so much complexity to observability and instrumentation um, and, and setting config files and setting alert policies and just so much hands-on work that it's really not efficient. It's more efficient to do it as code. And so uh, the SLM team, the service level management team, Elena and her team have thought about that as a first class solution uh, and have already implemented um, service levels as code, which has proven uh, extraordinarily powerful. So you no longer have to manually click around and manually manage config files or UIs. You can now through Terraform set all the SLOs uh, that you need for your products and services, which is wonderful. Um, 
So we're going to pause now for uh, Q&A. And if we are lucky, I might even go into the product itself to show you some of the cool things about uh, the service level management application. So any questions or answers, uh, please post them in chat. And again, if you didn't uh, catch me in the beginning, um, there is a poll available. So if you go over to the session section, upper right hand corner, uh, you'll see that there's a section for polls and we want you to go ahead and read those questions and, and click some of those answers. Um, and we can uh, show some of those results later. So we have a question from APH. Sounds great. Do you also plan to support multi-window and multi-burn rate alerts for less false positives? So uh, to me, that sounds like the error budget. And uh, we are working. The error budget is available uh, in, the, in the early access program, but it's not a time-based error budget yet. It is a request-based error budget. Um, but yes, there are uh, definitely thoughts, ideas, and solutions in play uh, for um, looking at multi-burn rates for alerting. And alerting uh, is certainly going to be part of the service levels. Any other questions? And I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second so I can actually get the, uh, the in-product demo up and running. Uh, so Michael has a question. What are the known limitations to the TF provider so far? Or saying differently, what features are in the roadmap to be made available in TF provider? Can you clarify for me TF provider? Elena knows what you're talking about. Ha! Terraform, ah, thank you. <laughs> so no limitations known so far for the Terraform um, provider, which is great. Elena is encouraging you to try it out. She is dying for your feedback. Um, that's the whole point of the early access program is to get our products and services out there quickly uh, and, and as early as possible. So you can tell us uh, what you like and what you don't like uh, and what you would like to see more of. All right, as we're waiting for questions, I'm going to go ahead and, and attempt an in-product demo of the early access program. And so here we have what we call our Demotron account. Uh, Demotron is a great place to uh, show uh, how things work, and it is a fictitious company set up. It's a telco company, so we, it's about mobile devices and browsing them and shopping for them and buying them online. Um, and in order to access service levels, you're going to want to see over here on the more position uh, of the menu right there. You want to drop down and go to service levels. So there's service maps and service levels. Don't do like me and always click on service maps. Click on service levels. And you'll see here that some service levels have been established already. Um, and you can see this is done very well on the service boundary of login service. So it's measuring the output of the uh, response time and error rates of login. And we are looking for a response time below 100 milliseconds and error free, which is great. And our target for that is to be 99.99% within that um, SLI. So again, we want to have 99.99% of our transactions within 100 milliseconds and error free. And we can see if you click on that, well, first of all, you can see it's green, meaning, yay, we're meeting our target. And you can see that we have 100% um, of the budget remaining. Again, it's a request-based uh, budget. And as of right now, we are within 100% of um, uh, 100 percent of our requests right now are meeting that particular objective which is great now if it were to drop close to the target it would turn orange or if it was to go below the target of 99 or four nines let's just say four nines uh, then you would see uh, the red indicating that we're not meeting our um, our compliance or our error budget uh, for that particular objective you can also um, 
show the particular service that you are uh, targeting in that objective. You can see that uh, we can look at the current telemetry. We can see all the entities that are connected to this, uh, to this particular service. Um, so we have two things calling this service. We have uh, two synthetic monitors calling. We have an inbound service and we have uh, 10 hosts, et cetera, et cetera. So if there was an issue going on right now, like maybe down here on the web portal, uh, we can click on that web portal. Do, 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 do. Oops. There we go, showing a deep preview for the web portal and try to determine uh, what might be uh, causing the web portal to be missing its SLO target. You can see all the telemetry is available there. You can also click on the service level objective itself and get more detail under the service level objective. So we can see what is the attainment over time. So again, this is the percentage of transactions or the percentage of events, right? Because we're not limited to response time and error rate. It could be queue depth. It could be SQL pool connections. Um, but what is the percentage of events that are me um, meeting the successful criteria of the objective? If there were bad events showing, you would see that over here in the good and bad responses. So any events that were considered not meeting the objective would show up here. And again, compliance, error budget, um, and uh, the SLL attainment over time in, uh, in relative to the target. I'm going to check the questions before going forward. All right, so we have another question here. Our team has a, cr quote, crash budget for our mobile application. Can the error budget in the service level management tool be used to track crashes as well? Yes. So um, what's really great about this, and, and you know what? That's a perfect uh, segue into the next part of the demo. So what's really great about this is when you go to add a service level. So I just clicked on a button called add service level indicator. That is the upper left hand corner. OK. And when I click that, I get options. I can select entities or uh, workloads. So I can select by entity type or I can select um, other uh, all sorts of, of different options. But basically, for simplicity, I'm going to just select uh, one type here. So let's do mobile. I'm doing a live unscripted demo here. So bear with me. You know how those go. Uh, so let's select a mobile application. And here we have our Android application. I'm going to select that. It's been a while since I've uh, done um, mobile crash rates. I do a lot of documentation these days, a lot less hands-on technical work. So you're going to have to bear with me. But let's start. I'm going to give it a shot. Uh, and maybe some of the relics on the call can help me out here. Uh, but I'm going to say from mobile session, uh, and I'm going to say uh, where entity ID equals, and I'm just doing, you know, you can do where app name equals, where uh, uh, telemetry type equals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm going to say, uh, just because it's on the example here, time since load. Of course, there's a, a, a crash rate we can include there, but I'm not going to go there because I'm going to look really stupid because I haven't done this in a while. I'm a little rusty on the on the mobile data. Uh, so I'll say time since load under, uh, let's say, five seconds. I don't know. Um, and what we see here is, bear with me. There we go. Okay, we have our uh, valid events, which I have to work on, uh, and good events. Uh, let's see. Uh, again, you got to be good at NERCL. Um, it looks like I missed something here. I'm checking to see I spelled everything correctly. It looks like I might have. Thank you, Elena. <laughs> Elena is helping me out here with the example. Um, and so let's see, we want that. Yep. And then we want valid for mobile session. Let's just take that out. 
it's entity good that's why yep i did that i was practicing elena again this morning <laughs> and that's exactly what i did this morning thank you all right so now whew, uh saving grace here so now you can see that for this mobile session and, and again we can do crash rates i just i don't want to look stupid uh but you can do crash rates i'm looking at just time since load uh and you can see your valid events because you have to look at all the events right is there and then how many actually met that particular threshold that's there so you can see a combination of the two uh, so good. I got my queer. I got my Nurkle right, right, which is great. And now we can see uh, how we're doing over time. So this is a, a 15 day window, and it says you know about 75 percent met that criteria here. We went down a little bit, but overall it looks like we're around a 75 percent match, which is fine. So I'm going to add now the service level objective. I'm going to say over a seven day period i really want to stay around that 70 percent target so you'll notice the target line drops right and it shows us a great baseline so i just did a visual baseline of that uh we'll continue there um and i'll give this a quick description so time since load slo uh under five seconds within seven days so now there's a little caveat here. Ellen is going to cringe when I do this, but, um, oh, I can't save because I don't have permission. Uh, but once you save, we create what's called an event to metric rule. And so for the first few minutes, while that new event to metric rule is, is calculating, you won't see the result immediately. But after a few minutes, you'll begin to see that result. So imagine that this is exactly the query, you know, that I just set up uh, for mobile session. So yes. Um, you can do this for crash rates. You can do it for any bit of data across one or more uh, of your entities. You're welcome. I'm glad you like the answer. I enjoy challenges like that. Okay. So that actually concludes the demo. Um, again, get on that early access program. I think, <laughs> yeah, I don't have permissions to create new slides. I keep forgetting that. Um, I believe Elena gave the link or Dan. Okay. Dan earlier on gave the link to sign up for the EAP, which is the early access program. What you do is just fill out that form and then Elena and her team will go and grant you access to the beta. This is the beta that we're showing and you can go ahead and, and set up those crash mobile, uh, uh, those, uh, which call it crash budgets, uh, that you currently have and, and watch that fly in new relic. Okay. I believe, let's see. Thank you, A. This looks amazing. It's exactly what I'm missing. Glad you like it. And Dan posted the early access program link again for you. All right. So I'm out of I'm out of demo material, and now I need everybody here uh, to ask more questions. I'm dying to answer. Put me on the spot again. We already got two people signed up for the early access program. Ah, you made Elena's day, trust me, which is great. You make Elena's day, you make my day. All right. Oh, that's right, the polls. So again, I don't know if I can show my screen. It'll probably cause some interesting feedback loop, uh, but let's see if I can show my screen here. Yeah, there's that feedback loop I expected. Okay, so if you go over uh, to this section right here, under session and then right there for polls whoops big feedback loop uh so yeah up here on session and then click here on polls you'll see there's the question there on the poll and then you just need to click one of the answers i don't know if it's multiple select or single select um and there are three questions that's really going to help us understand more about you and and how to uh build the product and the solutions for your needs for where you're at today uh, in your particular problem solution uh, domain. Let me get rid of this uh, feedback loop here. There we go. Go back to chat. All right. So 
Um, don't feel obligated to stick around. If you want to take a quick break before the next session, um, you know, absolutely go and do that. Grab some refreshments, uh, uh, heed nature's call. Um, but I will be here until the end of the session and I'll try to eliminate any awkward silence. Maybe I'll click around in the product some more. Otherwise, please feel free to, uh, uh, chat. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for that feedback. You're welcome. All right. And there's going to be an email survey as well. Please uh, sign up for that swag. Ah, Arpin, if I said your name correctly, I hope. Uh, we have built a similar SLI, SLO view using NERCL queries and custom dashboarding. Any benefits in using the new service level objectives aside from ease of use? So the long term benefits absolutely are going to be there. One of the things I'm really excited about is the ability to organize all the SLOs into categories or by uh, hopefully by tagging. So, for example, uh, thank you, Michael. The, the best way to increase adoption and awareness, again, that's the biggest challenge, right, is to get your boss and your boss's bosses and, and the people who write the checks for uh, your work to really be interested in what you're doing. And the best way to get their interest, to get their adoption of what you're doing, is to match what you're, uh, the technical work that you're doing to the business. Um, and so, Arpin, the, 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 the reason I'm really excited is because once you set up all these service level objectives for the technical need, right, are my services doing what they're supposed to, then you can categorize them into business needs. Like, uh, what is my, is my conversion funnel working? Is my login, um, all my login apparatuses working? Are my uh, checkout lanes working? Um, uh, that ability that uh, that's coming in the long term is definitely a value add, in my opinion. Right now, it's highly, um, uh, that makes a lot of sense. So S, uh, SLOs will be entities in New Relic, which can be queried via NERCLE. Yes, exactly. So you're, you're essentially doing the same thing. Like you said, right now, ease of use uh is there um elena says an additional benefit is also having service level objective data connected to the rest of the nr1 platform entities thank you elena that's right so as you um as you uh set these up and your thresholds are triggering yellow orange you know the status is changing those statuses or status eyes however you want to pronounce that will be attached to the rest of the views in the platform so business uh, organization or organization by category or buckets of SLOs, aggregation up to the executive level, right? Uh, and um, context within the rest of the platform. So your SLOs, just like when you look at over on the right. So if I click entity preview uh, over on the right, show entity preview, you'll see how we, we provide context here at the bottom right. So these are uh, workloads that are connected. These are synthetic monitors that are connected, inbound services, hosts. Um, that's that's telemetry and context. And service level objectives will be added uh, to this context across many views, not just this little uh, uh, summary view. Uh, we have another question. Great. Not sure if this is something you can share, but about when will the SLM tool uh, be available for wide use for general, we call GA, general uh, uh, availability. Uh, curious to know because I currently have some of the SLO views via customer dashboard, customer or custom dashboard widgets, and therefore wondering how much time I should invest in that custom dashboard. I knew that's what you meant. Yeah. Um, how much time I should invest in that. So I'm not going to steal Elena's thunder on that one. So I'll, <laughs> I'll let Elena decide if she's going to uh, give you the GA estimate. Uh, on that, but I can tell you it's um, it's exciting. The timeline and the roadmap is certainly exciting. Uh, as far as how much time to invest in that, um, I think, and I'll put Elena on the spot here. There she goes. She gave the answer. Uh, when we say first quarter of 2022, I think we mean I think we mean the January uh, quarter because our fiscal cycle is a little weird. Um, so. January, March. Yeah. Thank you, Elena. <laughs> Our first quarter is in April. Anyways, 
uh, <laughs> more March. So about, you know, about March time of, uh, in about a couple of months, right? So we're looking at a couple of months, which is great. Um, now, as far as investing time now, I will put Elena on the spot. Absolutely invest time in talking to Elena. So sign up for the early access program and talk to Helena and her team, because I know she wants to hear what you uh, are thinking and what your ideas are for what you've already done in service level management. So please, see, she she's uh, backed me up on that. Yes, please. All right. So I think we have five minutes left. Um, I'm going to start signing off. Again, thank you all for joining us today on, on Data Nerd Days. This has been so exciting. Thank you for having me and Elena and, and Dan. Um, and I look forward to doing another session with you. And please enjoy the rest of your, your day here with us. And I hope you learn a lot. And I hope we help you improve your observability, especially your observability maturity. So you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you all. And have a great time. <laughs>